My guest today is Professor Janet Curry, who is Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University and the co-director of Princeton Center for Health and Wellbeing. She also co-directs the program on families and children at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So you had a testimony uh, to the House Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness in Growth. I, I guess just last week, um, loved your photograph with Nancy, by the way. Uh, uh, could you summarize your remarks to the committee? So my remarks focused on the effects of inequality on children. And I was trying to make two broad points. So the first point was that uh, poverty is very damaging to children. And that may seem obvious, but there's always the argument potentially that, you know, well, maybe it's not poverty per se, maybe it's something else that's related to poverty, you know, family background or something. But I think there's a lot of evidence, which was summarized actually in a National Academy report recently, that yes, there's a causal effect of poverty on children. And conversely, if you give poor families money, uh, that that helps. So that was kind of the first point. And then the second point was that a lot of the social programs that have been implemented in the past 20, 30, even 40 years have had tremendous effects. So we always hear about how, you know, basically everything is getting worse or, you know, poverty doesn't change over time. But in fact, in the U.S., it's changed a lot. Um, so some of the things that I would point to, and I did point to in my testimony, are the effects of public health insurance for children, which uh, people think immediately about the Affordable Care Act in 2010. But I'm talking about things that happened 30 years before that, that covered pregnant women and all poor children. Uh, and that's just had a tremendous impact, not only on saving lives, but preventing disability and making people into more productive adults. Um, similarly, early childhood education uh, has really spread. So we have the federal program, Head Start, but we have lots of state and local programs as well, which really make an impact on poor children. And then the third thing I would point to is nutrition programs like uh, SNAP, which used to be called food stamps, or um, the supplemental feeding program for women, infants, and children, or school lunch. You know, those programs all have a big impact as well. Uh, so the kind of thing that President Kennedy saw when he went to Appalachia and saw, you know, people who had obvious malnutrition, that really hardly exists anymore in the U.S., and it's because of these programs. Yeah, so I always felt that, and obviously I don't know much about it, but initial conditions matter a lot. So if you measure outcomes, um, it's really sort of the initial conditions have a big impact on it, right? So we had a president not too, too long ago who suggested that his dad gave him only a few million dollars and look what he has accomplished. Uh, is a level of ignorance that generally doesn't exist in general public, I would imagine, but uh, clearly in presidents uh, seem to exist. Um, but, um, you know, so the initial conditions, and initial conditions is not right after birth, but also prenatal care, right? Yes, that's really been a, a focus of a lot of my work is looking at things that happen to people in utero and what effect that has on their their later life. Uh, there w is a medical literature which talked about fetal effects or fetal programming, uh, the idea being that, for example, if your mother faced famine in utero, that would change the metabolism of the developing child. And there's evidence that a much broader range of things also have an impact, like severe stress for the mother, um, uh, violence, all kinds of things. So, yeah, so people really don't start on the same level. They don't all get a few million dollars, but they don't even get the same health endowment. So some people have a predisposition to have 
worse health outcomes uh, because of things that they had no control over. Yeah, so from a policy perspective, um, if you look at the sort of the, the total economics of an individual, um, you know, you look at, uh, the, the, I mean, we are spending 20% of GDP on healthcare. So healthcare is a big chunk of our expenses. Crime, um, taxes. Um, so if you look at the total economics of an individual, society has very high return by investing early to an individual, right? Yeah, it actually does. Um, somebody who's been doing a terrific job quantifying that is a professor at Harvard named Nathaniel Hendren. And he has a big project kind of evaluating all social programs in the same framework. And what he shows is consistently spending on child programs has the highest return because you can really shape somebody's entire trajectory you know so we spend on old people because we think it's the right thing to do but we don't regard that as an investment and it's not right it's not like if you give health care to an 80 year old that they're going to all of a sudden go out and you know contribute a huge amount to gdp although maybe they'll look after their grandchildren or something like that but uh yeah so i that kind of argument is kind of a two-edged sword, I think, because on the one hand, it is true that spending money on children is an investment. But on the other hand, then we get this argument that to spend on children, it has to you know, produce benefits that exceed the cost to government or something like that. And I do think there's an argument for saying that just like we spend on old people, we should spend on children because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I felt, Janet, that uh, in children's case, the net present value can be demonstrably shown to be very high. Um, and as you say, it's a double-edged sword because uh, when you say, well, if you spend that on an older person, well, maybe then PV is not very high. So, so, so why do we do that? Um, but that's, <laughs> that's a different question. Um, but going back to the children, I mean, from an economic perspective, I would imagine we can demonstrably show the NPV is extremely high for society to, to spend, to invest in children. Yes. So if you take, um, for example, the Medicaid program that I was talking about earlier, uh, a really interesting thing about that was that the big rollout was in the 90s and early 2000s. So the people who are affected as young children now are you know, 30 years old. So you can look at those cohorts and say, oh, if they had health care when they were young, what impact does that have on them as, as young adults? And so a, a number of different evaluations have been done looking at a whole range of outcomes and they show, okay, they're less likely to have chronic conditions, they're less likely to have disabilities, they're more likely to be working, they earn more, they pay more taxes, they have more education. It, you know, practically any outcome that you look at, people are doing better through having access to basic health care when they're young. Um, similarly, early childhood programs have been evaluated and uh, shown very high returns on things like people getting more education, being more likely to go to college, being less likely to commit crime. Um, so these are all things that have a really high social return. Yeah, and, and I know that you have done a lot of work in disparity. So this is not an even field. So even if, even if one believes the net present value of investing in children is high, the question is, how do we practice it? Um, and the, the practical aspects of it, it, it the, it's highly varied, isn't it? I mean, uh, some people understand it, some people don't, some policymakers do, some don't. So, so what's the disparity that we see in that realm? So we see huge disparities in the sense that almost anything that you can imagine that's sort of harmful for young children is more likely to happen to them if they're poor than if they're not. And in some sense, I think that that's kind of a, 
operational definition of poverty. You know, if you're in a situation where a lot of bad things are going to happen, whether it's having accidents because nobody's available to properly supervise you or being exposed to harmful pollutants because you live close to a manufacturing plant, you know, there's just this huge list of possibly bad things that can happen and have long-term consequences. And so, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the way that U.S. society is there, these disparities are not sort of random. They tend to be focused on certain groups, you know, people of color, uh, low-income people, tend to be much more exposed to to harmful things. And then that perpetuates uh, a lower socioeconomic status. And, and so, uh, it, you, as you say, it's systemic. Um, the disparities are systemic. And we can see it, right? We can see it in the data. Um, but why can why can this insight get to policy? I mean, what 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 are the issues that you're dealing with? So there's a lot of difficult issues uh, in a lot of countries. They have universal programs to provide a lot of these things, which we really struggle with in the U.S. So I think about uh, some kind of national health insurance, which exists in a lot of countries. Um, you know, here we have all these means tested programs and we have this really entrenched idea that like some people deserve help and other people don't deserve help. Um, in, in some sense, that's why I like to focus on children, because I feel like it's harder to argue that a child doesn't deserve help. Um, most people are willing to agree that every child does. And then there are uh, also arguments about what's the best way to give people help. So, um, uh, you know, something that's really changed recently is there's more discussion about giving poor people money. And again, you know, that's what we did with old people. So there was a lot of controversy in the 80s and stories about old people having to eat pet food because they didn't have enough money to buy food. What did we do? We increased social security payments and we really greatly reduced poverty among old people. And somehow that was fine to solve poverty among old people by giving them money, but it wasn't fine <laughs> for, for children and their families. But that seems to be changing. So now you know, we have this new child tax credit, which is refundable, which will essentially give low income families money. And we have evidence that that is an effective way to to help families and can really make a difference to child development. So maybe we've made a breakthrough in the way that people are thinking about these things. Yeah, so, so I want to get your perspective. This is not in your research, but I want to get your perspective on this. So. Um, the birth rates are falling all around the world. I think only Africa currently shows, Africa as a continent currently shows positive growth rates. Um, so there are forecasts, forecasts are always going to be wrong, but anywhere between 2060 and 2100, world population is going to come to a peak at around 9.5 billion and that rapidly declined from it. Uh, declined from that point. Uh, this is quite dramatically different from people thought maybe 100 years ago that the world is going to be run over by Homo sapiens, but that's not going to be the case. So we might be approaching a regime where uh, human resources are probably the most valuable thing in the world. Um, and do, do you think? Um, do you think that will make a difference? I mean, since right now, you know, sometimes I feel like policymakers think of humans as a cost, not as a resource. You know, we think about Medicare, Medicaid, CMS, 20% uh, of our GDP, you know, it's very costly to keep all these humans around. Uh, but I think it's the wrong way of looking at it, don't you think? Oh, I totally agree. I think people, say middle-aged people should be thinking you know, who's going to pay for their Social Security? It's all these children 
that are being born now. And if they, if those children don't get a fair chance, then they're not going to be paying very much taxes to pay for you know, our social security. That's one kind of selfish way to look at it, but I think it's really true. Um, it, we ought to be investing more in the human resources that we have. And paradoxically, that might slow the fertility transition. You know, it's very difficult now for families with children if they don't have a lot of means because, you know, there's, say, a child care crisis. What are you going to do? Leave your child alone, not go to work, risk getting fired. There's always this stress associated with with looking after kids and you know european countries also have declining fertility and it started earlier than in the u.s but in some places that have more supports for families it, it's been slower than in other places uh, yeah so, so i want to go uh, i don't know much about this jan so the scandinavian systems appear to be a little different from ours. Um, they have universal health care, uh, their education systems, for example, Finland always comes on top, uh, the way that they think about education. So what are the aspects of these systems that we can learn from? Um, I guess one place I was always really impressed with was, was Norway, because they got this windfall from the North Sea oil, but we have a lot of examples of places where there was a natural resource windfall and it was all frittered away or stolen or, you know, some terrible thing that it, it created problems rather than solutions. And the Norwegians were incredibly disciplined about taking their money, investing it, you know, saying this isn't going to last forever. We're going to invest it. Now we have this fund which we can use to greatly improve social programs. So maybe one thing to take away from Scandinavia is that those used to be very poor countries, right? So in the Second World War, shortly after the Second World War, they were not rich countries. Mm. And they have, through good government, and uh, having vision created societies which are rich and equal. Uh, so in that sense, it really is uh, inspiring. They weren't always like that. It, it's really something that they've done. So is this a size problem, Janet? So, I mean, in the US we have you know, the greatest researchers, um, greatest economists, we see all this data, we know what the right thing to do, but we don't be, we don't seem to be able to get anything done. Is it sort of a size problem? So you, you look to, you know, Sweden, Norway, Finland, less than 10 million people, you look to Canada, less than 40 million people. So are we sort of stuck? I mean, we, can we implement these ideas in a 330 million people system? Well, that is a really good question. Um, one thing that's true is that state and local governments have a bigger role here than many people credit them. So if you look at a place like California, it's bigger than France. Um, so, you know, if California does something, it has uh, a real impact. So, for example, California has been a leader in environmental regulation um, and that has kind of pulled the whole country along with it. So, so I don't think it's hopeless, but I do think that the American path will be different than in smaller European countries. Yeah, so, so I want to go into um, sort of, uh, you've done some research outside the US. Um, so recent papers, one of them is the evolution of mortality inequality in 11 OECD countries. You say long life is considered fortunate, uh, fortunate in every culture. So inequities uh, in mortality are fundamental to the way that we think about whether a society is equitable. Uh, many prominent recent studies argue that although most countries have seen dramatic declines in mortality through the decades, the gains have not been distributed equally. 
Um, th this is sort of an eye opener for me. You know, I would think about OECD countries, perhaps not the US, but OECD countries are more equitable in their stance, but that is not what the data is showing. Uh well, more equitable than what? I guess they're, they are. They are more equitable than in the U.S. Um, so, the of the European countries that we looked at, um, it you can't really talk about mortality differences in the U.S. without talking about race because they're so the life expectancy is so different for white people and black people in the U.S. But if you start in 1990, the life expectancy for white Americans was about the same as in Western Europe, in the richer places, but not in the poorer places. If you go to uh, the most recent available data, life expectancy in the US is lower uh, for everybody than it is in Europe. It has improved a lot for black Americans and has been growing faster for black Americans than even in Europe. So, so the Europeans started off more equal, have stayed more equal. And in the US, um, you know, before we had really obvious inequality, now we seem to have a big problem that you know, life expectancy for everybody has fallen. So let me ask you sort of a loaded question. So when we look at sort of cross-sectional data uh, with race, we find high metabolic syndrome diseases in, in African-Americans, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and so on. Um, are those diseases a function of initial conditions we talked about, or are those a function of genetics? Oh, well, it, it's not really that useful to think of it as an either or thing. So we all have genetic predispositions to different things. And whether those things happen or not depend on the environment. Yeah. The environment in utero is especially important because that's a period of such tremendous growth for the organism. So if any subtle thing changes uh, in the way that your genes are expressed, that's going to have a profound influence. So those kind of diseases that you mentioned, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, there's a lot of evidence that those are related to conditions in utero. So poor conditions for pregnant black women um, would be expected to lead to worse health for infants, and we do see that. We see that the incidence of low birth weight is twice as high for black uh, babies as for white babies, and the rate of infant mortality is twice as high for black babies as white babies. But then for the survivors, there's still uh, long-term consequences of that. So yes, I think that some of the health differences that we see are due to uh, cumulative effects from even before birth of disadvantage. So, so we go to OECD, uh, going back to the paper, the OECD countries, um, where we don't, I mean, I don't know this, but uh, the, the race uh, distribution is not as, as high as we have here in the US, right? They are, um, the, the racial composition is similar, I would think, right? Well, you know, that's an interesting thing to think about because uh, you were asking earlier basically whether it's more possible to um, sort of have radical change if you have unity because small places is more likely to be everybody's the same and more unified. And what we see in Europe is we see a lot of difference sort of creeping in and with that reaction, you know. so. Uh, you think about the right wing in France being kind of anti-Muslim, uh, anti-African immigrant. You have the waves of immigration, you know, so people being hostile to Syrian immigrants coming into Germany. Uh, the English, you know, sort of wanting to stop immigration 
coming in. So I think it it creates a, a similar sort of dynamic as you see in the U.S. when uh, people perceive that there are these large uh, cultural differences. But it's still small in terms of percentages, aren't they? I mean, the, the recent uh, immigration into into OECD uh, and and the you know the African um, immigration to France aren't they generally smaller compared to what we have? Yeah, it is. It is smaller, but that makes it very interesting that it provokes such a reaction. Yeah. Right. Because it's objectively speaking, these are wealthy countries. They can easily afford to absorb relatively small numbers of people, and yet, you know, it's had a huge effect on on their politics and on their policies. But but you do see sort of mortality inequality when you look at these countries. Are, are, are those inequalities similar to what we have in the U.S. or what is sort of the comparable metric there? Uh, they're much less than in the U.S. So the, in, in fact, for younger age groups in a lot of European countries, there is no gradient. So the you know, children of rich people and the children of, of poor people are equally likely to die. Um, and that's a very low rate. So they've been very successful in... Um, making sure that everybody has the care necessary to equalize mortality. Is it the is it a function of the healthcare systems in those countries? I think it's the healthcare system, but it's also the other supports. Uh, a lot of these countries have uh, nurse home visiting programs as part of their healthcare system. So, you know, somebody will have a baby, the nurse will come to the home, they will evaluate whether somebody needs more assistance. They put them in touch with the services that they need. Um, so there's there's just a lot more support for children. They'll have good child care that's available at a young age um, with highly trained people to look after the children. Um, so mm. I think all of those things are also important and not just the when we think of health care, we think of the going to the hospital. That's very important, but the rest is important too. So sort of a societal support system um, in some ways. So you have another paper, inequality and mortality, update estimates for US, Canada, and France. So you're comparing three different countries. US and Canada is this really good sort of a comparison. They're close enough, but we have different healthcare systems. Um, we seem to do similar things. So, so what, do, what do you find in Canada in contrast to the US? So inequality, or mortality is lower for every age group in Canada than it is in the US, which is really very striking. Um, inequality is also lower in Canada than in the US. Um, and if you look at changes over time, the place where the, the only age group where the U.S. became more like Canada over time was for young children. So the group of people who got public health insurance, you see that the inequality and in mortality declines a lot and declines almost to the Canadian level. And then for every other group, you persist in having a lot more inequality for Americans than for Canadians. So it's not just the mortality, though. It's also morbidity, right? It, it, it's sort of the general health of the population, would you say? Well, so one reason why people, public health people look at mortality is because it gets everybody's attention, thinking about death. But also, it's a good indicator for mortality. Where you see a lot of death, you often see a lot of sickness and disability as well. Uh, so it's kind of a marker for that. It's a good proxy for sort of the total cost. So when you, high, when you see high mortality, you can reasonably assume that the population is sicker and, and possibly more costly to maintain, right? So, so the economic question for policymakers remains to be, 
how do I minimize? I mean, if they want to really focus on cost and they want to minimize cost, it appears to me that early intervention uh, on kids is probably the easiest and the cheapest way to do it. Yes, I think that's right. And if you think about um, intervening so that kids are, are healthy and grow up healthy, then you fast forward to the time when they're 50 or 60, they're going to be a lot less likely to be disabled from various conditions. Right, right. And increasingly we have, you know, older people working longer, you know, the, the idea of retirement uh, seems like um, an old concept <laughs> anymore. If you can contribute to society, it appears a prescription is to contribute to society. So, so if you can keep a very healthy population, they're going to add value to society for a long time. So again, going back to the NPV question, um, the returns on uh, intervening on, on kids appear to be extremely high. Well, in um, Nathaniel Hendren's analyses, in several cases, he says that they're infinite. <laughs> because <laughs> the, 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 the benefits exceed the cost to, to such an extent. Um, but yes, that's certainly true. And the inequality that I was talking about in mortality kind of manifests itself in, two, the, you know, there's really two groups among older Americans. So there's, um, you know, people I know who are academics who are still being able to be productive at 75 and even 80. And then there are a lot of people who by the time they're 50 years old have disabilities that prevent them from working. Uh, and so you end up with these sort of two two groups. And disability programs are very rapidly growing and uh, very expensive and consume a lot of health care as well. So you know, preventing those kinds of disabilities is a really important thing. Yeah, yeah. You have another, very quickly, another study from Germany um, uh, so German Federal Statistical Office on Population Counts, births, Deaths, and Income. Um, so what do you find there? So you looked at mortality rates from 1990 to 2015 for different age groups. So, so what's the observation there? Oh, so the, the interesting thing that you can do looking at Germany is to compare what happened in East Germany and West Germany. And so... Um, I think what it illustrates is, you know, we focus a lot on inequality, but we also need to focus on the levels. And so in the former East Germany had fairly high mortality rates, but it was very equal. <laughs> hmm. And that's not necessarily what you want. So with reunification, they had declines in mortality, but increases in inequality. You know, so there was a sort of obvious trade off there. And so, um, so, 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 what is your observation between East Germany and West Germany? Um, what, what's the conclusion from the paper? Oh, well, I would say the conclusion is that inequality. I mean, one way to have perfect equality is to have everybody have a really miserable existence, right? And that's totally equal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's not what it's you easy want. To do. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's an that's an important point. So, so again, you know, this is sort of a system question. Given some initial conditions, how do you optimize the system with some resource constraints? And um, maybe sometimes reducing inequality is not necessarily the objective function. Is what you're saying. I think it's really important to think about what the objective function is. Um, and so for inequality per se, if everybody had a very comfortable level of existence and then some people had really a lot of money, you know, what would be wrong with that? Uh, I think that what's wrong with that is more political and more about the future of the system than it is uh, to do with how people's uh, human capital development is going to proceed. 
for example. You know, so in that, ex when people have a lot of money, it does tend to corrupt the political process. It may tend to undermine public institutions if people can just withdraw their own children from public schools or from public hospitals or all of those services, then they may not care about paying taxes to support them. Right? So it does have a corrosive effect, but it's not the same as the effect of poverty, which is really, um, you know, destroying people's bodies. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex interaction. So, um, I mean, we have two guys in the US uh, trying to make Mars great again, which is probably a good thing. Um, but that doesn't affect most of 330 million people. Um, getting, uh, you know, trying to find the next day's meal, right, in some sense. Uh, and so, but we don't see that in, in sort of small systems like the Scandinavian countries that we mentioned and, and so on. We do see it in big systems like India, China, the US, uh, where the disparity is, is very, very visible and clear. Um, and the data is also very clear from a policy perspective. But uh, it looks like we are unable to really, uh, really affect any policies around this. Around, Maybe it's a more complex question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, around inequality per se. Around inequality per se. Yeah. Yeah, I I do think that's one of the problems with really extreme inequality is that at a certain point you sort of lose control of the top end of the population you know they can just do whatever they want <laughs> you're not going to be able to tax them very effectively because they're going to be able to undermine the government's ability to do that right right um i want to uh, sort of go into another bucket of papers uh, that you have so one of them is do urgent care centers reduce medicare spending for the very interesting. So you said we examined the impact of uh, the opening of a new urgent care center, UCC, on healthcare costs and the utilization of care among nearby Medicare beneficiaries. So 2006-2016. So, so what do you find here, the opening of a Medicare, uh, sorry, uh, an urgent care center? How does it affect? So what we find is that it actually has no effect on emergency room use has really little effect on whether people go to see their own doctor, but it has a positive effect on whether they get inpatient hospital care and especially elective care. So what we think is happening is that now a lot of urgent care centers are owned by either by hospitals or by say, you know, venture capitalists who bought up chains of urgent care centers, and then they have a contract with the hospital, essentially to deliver patients to the hospital. <laughs> so people go because it's convenient um, and they tend to get more care uh, outside of hospitals with an urgent care center. So they're getting urgent care center care on top of what they would get, which may be good, may be bad, but then they end up having more trips to the hospital out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's an increase in Medicare spending, not a decrease. And we were not able to see that it had any impact on mortality. Um, That's really interesting because I see this uh, urgent care center springing up all over the place, actually. Uh, and so you are saying it's sort of a feeder mechanism. Um, so, you know, let's capture the sick and let's make sure they don't go anywhere so that we can feed them to the hospital later. Sorry. Yeah, so, I mean, I think some hospitals might think of it more in terms of market share. You know, like we want to get our fair share of the, the patients, but the net effect seems to have been to actually increase utilization of care. So I think it's, you know, a larger point to be made is that one of the problems with the U.S. healthcare system and the reason why it's so expensive is it's very monopolized. Yeah. So we have, you know, monopolized health insurers. Um, if you look, say, within an urban area, how many health insurers are really competing in that area? 
it's really declined over time. The hospitals have all become part of large chains. Increasingly, they're owned by for-profit companies. Um, we have things like emergency departments within a hospital that are owned by a for-profit company, and that's where you get stuff like surprise billing, because that's another way to make money. Um, so you have all these monopolies going on, and then we wonder why the price is high. You know, <laughs> it's fairly obvious when you think about it. Right. Yeah. So. Um... That is sort of, I mean, everybody knows this. We have a system there. Nobody has an incentive to actually take care of the problem, um, except perhaps a patient, but patient is not necessarily knowledgeable, um, nor does she know the prices, price comparisons, uh, effectively to make the right decision. If the payers or providers don't appear to have the right incentive to take care of the problem. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So that is that's a system that is going to continue to sort of go in the wrong direction. Um, you have another paper, Doing More With Less, Predicting Primary Care Provider Effectiveness. I'm very interested in this, Janet, because I'm doing some AI work in, in primary care and behavioral health. So we analyze EMR data, anonymized EMR data on a, on a continuous basis. And um, I, I don't know if you say about this in this paper or, or somewhere else that there are a lot of variations, right, in in how primary care providers disperse uh, care. Um, we can't really predict <laughs> what they what they're going to do because there's so much variation. Uh, even though one would imagine these things should be fairly standardized, right? Yes, um, there was a really interesting paper done by some some people at um, I think they were at Stanford. So they, they were looking at two groups of physicians who were more or less effective. And what they found in their case, the, the patient outcomes were the same, but some people just ordered a lot more tests and spent a lot more money and took more time. The patient spent a longer time in the hospital to achieve the same outcome. Um, so that's a little bit what we find. We're looking at data from the Veteran Affairs Administration and we can see doctors who seem to be more effective in that their primary care patients end up in the hospital less and spend less over a three year period. And what we see is that the amount of, when we look at all the things that they, they get, they seem to get less of everything. They even get less primary care vision visits. So these, and the thing that makes our paper go is that in the VA, people are randomly assigned to primary care physicians. So you show up, you get the first available person, and then if you get one of these more effective doctors, you're gonna have better health outcomes and have fewer things done to you along the way. Yeah, this is, you know, so I've had a primary care physician for 30 years, Janet, and uh, he recently retired. So now I am, you know, on to somebody else. And I can clearly see the patient having a long-term relationship with their primary care provider is hugely important, right? Um, it, is, it is not a transaction, really. It's a relationship. Um, so the market is increasingly set up for a transaction, and the transaction doesn't really help you <laughs> in any way if the physician doesn't really know you well enough to do yeah. the right thing, right? I think um, that's a really good point. My my primary care physician retired a couple of years ago too, and I'm very sad about Those it. Those retirements should, uh, should be made illegal, I think. Yeah, well, he, he was really great and very thoughtful, and you could have a discussion about your care. My, my new person is also good, but I, you know, it's sort of an ideal to have that kind of a relationship with a provider. We have to be honest that it's happening less and less. And so a question is, given that it's happening less and less and more and more people are getting their health care, you know, from somebody in the CBS pharmacy or from the urgent care center, um, you know, among younger people, I think it's 
very unusual to have a primary care physician and have a long-term relationship with them. So we have to look at where we are and say, how could we make it better? And so, you know, maybe having more effective uh, electronic medical records could help. Maybe having more um, sensible algorithms. You know, a lot of people are getting all their health information from the internet with mixed results. Uh, so maybe trying to like, certify information more or help people to get reliable information that they could then take to a provider, helping them to access their own medical records and understand them. These are things which might make better use of the system that we have ended up with. Yeah, I mean, you know, so the emergence of the UCC, Surgeon Care Centers, I think sort of a symptomatic of this idea that we, we need um, sort of immediate gratification. So, you know, symptomatic treatments is what the whole system is geared toward. Right. Where, where do you have the pain? Let me take care of the pain. <laughs> oh, I don't want to knock them, you know. So I have a primary care physician, but when I needed to get COVID testing for various reasons, then I went to an urgent care center and I could get it immediately. Yeah. You know, uh, what's wrong with that? I would have had to wait to go sure. and see yeah. my primary care physician. Yeah, that is true, yeah. Um, so, so I'm going to finish up with uh, sort of the topical issue of COVID-19. Um, so you had a paper recently, trends in drug overdose mortality in Ohio during this first seven months of COVID-19 pandemic. Anecdotally, I'm, I'm hearing this from a variety of sources that uh, clearly the, the suicide rates have gone up um, all around the world, not only just in the U.S. Um, so, so what do you find in this particular paper? It is uh, drug overdose mortality. Yes, so we're looking at drug overdose mortality in Ohio. And the reason why we're looking at it in Ohio is because the, the medical examiner's offices make the aggregate data for each county available publicly. So you can get really up-to-date information. Um, in comparison, the data that the Centers for Disease Control gets is old. And so that has been a big problem with dealing with, with COVID is that all the federal officials, because we have a system where the data comes first to counties, then to states, then gets sent to the federal government, it's very slow. So they're trying to deal with this with data that's out of date, essentially. And so, you know, when the CDC has put to together data on drug overdoses, I think a lot of people don't realize what they're doing is it's, it's a projection based on data from six months ago, essentially. So we just wanted to look in real time at how the overdose problem was reacting to COVID. And I think the news was not wholly bad in the sense that we did see this big spike that people are talking about um especially in april may but then it started to come down so the cdc projection is still showing it high because the projection is very influenced by you know, what happened in the earlier period but what what we see is that the initial lockdown and disruption seemed to have caused this big spike but then things actually started to go back to how they were which is not great you know, there's still a lot of overdose deaths in Ohio, but it's not quite as catastrophic as some of the news reports would have you believe. So how, how does this interact with, we didn't talk a lot about, you know, sort of the mental health aspects. Um, do we see a significant contribution of mental health in this issue? Well, I think that the overdose problem in the U.S. is really a, a tragic end result of our medical system because uh, until very recently anyway, it was the case that most of the people who were addicted to opioids began taking them as prescription drugs which were prescribed to them by their doctors. And we still see even though 
uh, the CDC has put out new guidance and so on, we still see a lot of people being prescribed opioids for things where in the longer term, it's not going to help them. So, for example, if you have back pain, which a lot of people do, and you go to the doctor and they give you opioids, in the short run, it will make you feel great, right? It'll completely take care of your pain. But the problem is that you build up dependence to opioids. So if you keep taking the same dose, eventually your back pain is going to come back. Now you have to take a higher dose. So the end of the line for that is that you're going to have back pain and you're going to have an opioid problem. And that was created by your doctor giving you these opioids. So there's a trajectory of people starting to take opioids, taking more and more, then ending up going to something like heroin because it's cheaper. And then we have this terrible situation where because we created a huge market for illegal opioids, we had first heroin coming in and that was bad enough. And now we have fentanyl, which is just a disaster, right? Because it's so deadly. Uh, so we've created this situation and again, it's not hopeless, but I think the public policy has not been addressing the problem. So, you know, we need to get doctors to stop prescribing so many opioids. We prescribe more than anywhere else in the world. We have fewer restrictions than anywhere else in the world. Um, many places you cannot get opioids except in a hospital. You don't, you know, in Germany, they don't send you home with a 30 day supply which they frequently do here after even a minor surgery. So we have to stop doing that. And then we have to provide treatment for the people who are already addicted. And it seems that the medicated assisted treatment is effective at saving people's lives. And so we should be making it a lot easier for people to get those treatments. I mean, we had this totally crazy system until very recently where any doctor, any dentist, any veterinarian could prescribe for you opioids with very few restrictions. But if they wanted to treat your opioid addiction by prescribing medication-assisted treatment, they had to get a special license. They had to have restrictions on the number of patients that they were allowed to treat. Um, and so at least with COVID, the federal government has relaxed the restriction on the number of people that doctors are allowed to treat with medication-assisted treatment. Uh, but they just need, need to make it much easier for people to get treated. Mm -hmm. So in this data, if you, if you cut it by, let's say, people on Medicaid or race, do you see some distinct differences in this data? Uh, well, there, there have been differences. So until quite recently, white people were much more likely to be addicted. So interestingly enough, some of the biases in the system may have in fact protected black people. You know, so there's, a, there's evidence that doctors are less likely to prescribe painkillers to black people because they maybe believe that they're going to abuse them or something like that. Mm. Uh, black people in their turn are less trustful of medication, so they might be less likely to take it. And in this case, that turned out to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the group that was most affected first was actually middle-aged white women. And the reason for that, women go to the doctor more than men, women report more pain than men, so a middle-aged woman would go to her doctor with pain and she would get prescribed opioids. And so that's where it hit first. Um, unfortunately, it looks like blacks have now caught up. Uh, and so this is having a, an equally devastating effect on them. Um, you are asking about Medicaid, which is interesting as well because there are people out there who've argued that the opioid epidemic was caused by the ACA, which is just ridiculous because, you know, it, it basically already, uh, it was already a huge problem by 2014 when the provisions of the ACA took effect. And there really isn't any evidence that 
doctors serving people on Medicaid are more likely to prescribe opioids to them than doctors serving people with private health insurance. And the majority of people, so the irony is the majority of people who became addicted became addicted to drugs that their doctors um, prescribed to them. And to the extent that those doctors were paid by private health insurance that the employee's employer paid for, the employers were paying for their employees to get hooked on opioids. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's an incredible thing. So in conclusion, um, Janet, so going back to the, the testimony to the, to the House committee, um, so we understand disparities, disparities exist. We understand inequities exist. The data is pretty clear. So what would you suggest um, at this juncture um, from a policy perspective? What would be one or two things that you would you would uh, think would be sort of the most important things that we should really think about from a policy perspective? Well, so I mentioned earlier the child tax credit, which sounds kind of arcane, a tax credit, but it's actually a really big deal. And just by itself, it's projected to reduce child poverty by half. Now, at this point, it's only a temporary credit, so it would benefit some children for a few years and then expire. But if it were to be made a permanent part of the tax code, I think that would have a really big impact. Uh, similarly, some of the provisions in the second infrastructure bill to expand child care so all three and four year olds can have quality child care, that would have a big impact. Uh, thinking about paid leave, um, that should have some legs given COVID, right? We had workers who were going to work because they were when they were sick because they couldn't afford to stay home. We would really rather that didn't happen. Um, so, you know, those are a few things which I think could have an impact and they're actually on the policy agenda, which is very exciting. Yeah, get them early, get them healthy. Huge return for yes. society, right? Yes, that's, that's <laughs> everything that I've been saying in a few words. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Janet. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Oh, very happy to. Thank you for asking. Thank you.